this morning. Welcome to, to Parkview. We're excited to have you guys here. We are continuing our series, Foundations, talking about the foundations of our church, uh, specifically talking about the values that we believe in here as Parkview Christian Church. And <clears throat> like I've said so many times, I want to reinforce this. The values are essential for us to understand because the values are going to dictate the direction and the future of our church. It's like, where are we going as a church? Well, the values will dictate that. The values will also create the culture that we want to create. Now, of course, we already have culture in our church. We just want to adjust the culture a little bit to make sure that it's going in the right direction. So these values will dictate everything. And like we've said before many other times, uh, if something that we're doing doesn't line up with our values, we want to cut it out, right? And so this is uh, obviously a bit of an exhortation for everyone. If you guys are doing something in your life that doesn't match up with your values, say, oh, I value this, but then you're doing something the opposite. You're saying, well, I better cut that thing out of my life because it doesn't match up with my values. It's very important for families, of course. Um, so when we go through, we talk about, we're talking about the four values of our church. These are the four things that we have talked about. Um, we as Parkview Christian Church, we value glorifying Jesus, family, discipleship, and mission living. And so we've been going through each one of these uh, one by one. We, we went several weeks ago, we talked about glorifying Jesus and glorifying Jesus. We're saying we are all about Jesus, right? We want to make sure that we are celebrating, honoring Jesus in all that we do here at this church, right? Everything. So if we look at something, we say, no, that doesn't honor Jesus. We're cutting it out right? It has to glorify Jesus. Uh, number two, we talked about family, and we talked about how we are a big family united in Jesus. So we are here together because we believe in Jesus. And if you say, well, I don't believe in Jesus, that's okay. We're welcoming you into our family, and we're inviting you to believe in Jesus as well. Uh, but we, we have the support for one another as a family because we know that life is difficult, and things are up and down, and we want to be here to support one another through the ups and downs, Right? Thirdly, we talked about discipleship, and so what we said is we want to help people to know and experience Jesus personally, and, and this is really, really important because we, we want people to know the power of Jesus. We want them to be able to experience all the goodness, all the grace, all the love, everything that he has. We want them to experience that in their lives, and so that's true for everyone that's here, and we want to help you guys to go deeper in your relationship with Jesus so that you can experience everything that he has for you, because he has so much for us that we never experience, and we want people to go deeper in that, right? And then finally, we talked about mission living, and that's what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, and we're going to talk about it again today. And what we're saying is that we live on God's mission, and we talked about God's mission being a greater purpose that we could go and we could try to reach people with the message, the good news of Jesus Christ, right? Because we want to spread the message of salvation to everybody. So um, last week we were going through and we were talking in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, and then we also, as we were going through, we were talking um, about the definition of what mission living is. And so I want to read that for you guys again, just to make sure we keep pounding this home. Mission living is this, the idea of every believer in Jesus adopting the mindset or attitude of a missionary wherever they are, with the purpose of loving and sharing the good news of Jesus with everyone in their sphere of influence. All believers can become missionaries to their city, family, neighborhood, workplace, recreation place, etc. So this is very, very important. We want to be mission-minded. We want to be missionaries here in Chickasha and the greater area all around Grady County, wherever you are. And each one of us has a sphere of influence in our lives, right? We have people in our lives that we interact with that other people might not even know, but we do. And so it's our job to try to love those people and try to reach them with the message of Jesus. Because uh, I, I can't reach everyone in your life. You can't reach everyone in my life. I have people in my life that are not in your life, and you have people in your life that are not in my life. So we each try and do our part and try to draw people in to Jesus, right? This is what it's all about. And so we talked about how we are called to make disciples of all nations. Remember the Great Commissions in Matthew 28? He talks about how we are sent out. He said, go make disciples of all nations. And he says to go on out, he says to baptize them and teach them and uh, all these different things. But the, the main verb in that command is to go and make disciples, so how do we do that as individuals? I want to bring this down to a more micro level for us today. 
Uh, I want to make sure that it goes to each one of us individually. How do we as individuals go and make disciples? And I'm going to try and make this simple, uh, although it's, it's not as simple as I'd like. Uh, I'm going to try. I'd like to do this in three simple steps, okay? First step, how do we make disciples? Well, it starts off with us knowing Jesus. You have to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, plain and simple. And you say, yeah, okay, that makes sense, okay? We have a relationship with Jesus, okay? Jesus wants to know us. He wants us to experience him. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. God is not a distant force that just established the universe and said, go off and live your life however you want. God is a very personal God. He's so personal that he sent his son, Jesus, to come down to earth to take on human flesh to, so that we could have an idea of what God is all about and that he would come and die for us in order that we would be able to have a relationship with him. I mean, God is all about relationship. He's all about us knowing him and experiencing him. And this is one of the things that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 3. Take a look with me, Philippians 3, verses 8 through 11. It says this, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. So here, twice in this little passage, these four verses, he talks about in verse 8, the, the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He says, talks about knowing him. And then in verse 10, he says it more clearly, I think. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of the suffering, all these other things. He says, I want to know him. I want to have the knowledge of Jesus, and I want to know him. This talks about having a relationship with God. And so this is something that's very important. We as human beings have the opportunity to know God through Jesus Christ. And so this is what we have to start off with. We have to know him. And how do we know him? Well, we know him by faith in Jesus. We understand that he came, he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again. And through that faith, we enter into that relationship with him. Okay? So when you enter into a relationship, you meet somebody, how does it work? Well, you, you get to know them, right? You get to know their name, you meet them. And then what happens? Well, then you want to start to build a deeper relationship. You want to get to know them more. And so you talk with them more and you might ask questions of them and, and you kind of watch them and you start to see their tendencies and, and you start to build more and more intimacy over time. This is what marriage is kind of a picture of, right? Because we, as we're married here, we have an opportunity to be around someone all the time. We start to see their tendencies. We start to know them more. We start to see what do they like? What do they not like? right? What do they do in the morning? What do they do at night? You know, what are their tendencies? We start to get to know them very well. And so this is the same thing with Jesus. We have a relationship with him and we have the opportunity to know him. We get to study his word. This is where God reveals himself to us. And then we have the opportunity to see what he likes and what he dislikes. We see what he does and what he doesn't do. We see his personality traits. We see what his character is all about. This is very important. Then we talk to him, and we can ask him things. We can ask him questions. God, what's going on? I don't understand this. Well, God, why is this happening? I don't see this. God, what do you want me to do here? And we start to talk, and hopefully we start to hear from God a little bit, whether it be through his word or maybe God puts something in your heart for you to do, but God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to know him. Even in the Old Testament, this is interesting, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24 says this, but let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. Well, here, he's saying that we have the opportunity to know him, even in the Old Testament, even before the days of Jesus. And he starts to explain who he is because he says, he says, I'm a God who 
I have loving kindness and judgment and righteousness, and I bring these here on the earth. And you say, wow, well, this is a good opportunity to see God and get to know him more, right? So this is very important. We want to be on God's mission. We want to be doing the things that he wants us to do. We want to be busy about his work. Where does it start? It starts with a relationship with God. You have the opportunity to know him. Now, probably most of you are thinking, okay, I think I know him. Okay, great. Now we got to go deeper, right? We got to take it deeper. So this is the first step. Okay. So second, very simple. We want to grow in him. We want to grow in him. Very simple, right? So look with me in second Peter chapter three, second Peter chapter three, the very end verse 18, it says this, but grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. I'm sorry, of our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. He tells us here, very simple. You are to grow. Grow in what? He says you are to grow in the knowledge, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? You're supposed to grow in the grace and knowledge. So, this is awesome. We have a relationship with Jesus. And in that relationship with Jesus, we begin to grow. And he says, not only to grow, but he said, you want to grow in your knowledge of him, but also in his grace. How awesome is that? Okay. Grace means that you are receiving something from God that you did not earn. So we get all sorts of good things from God, right? Your salvation is by grace. You didn't earn your salvation. He died for you. And so you can receive that and be forgiven of everything you've ever done. Awesome. But that's not where grace stops. Grace continues on because God says, I want to know you. That's grace. To let God come into our lives when we're a bunch of sinners, we don't deserve that. So he says, hey, I'm going to give you more grace. I'm going to let you know me. And he says, I'm not only that, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. He's going to come and dwell inside of you. I'm going to adopt you into my family, and you're going to have an inheritance waiting for you in heaven. Well, we definitely didn't earn that, right? Heaven, inheritance, adoption, like this is crazy stuff. God just pours out so much grace upon us. And he says, I want you to grow in this grace. I want you to grow in this grace. So that means we've got to learn more about his grace, obviously through his word. He's going to keep revealing more and more of all the good things he does for us. But then we want to take that grace and start to shed that grace, share that grace with other people. And so he says, as we grow, we we should start to become more gracious, become more gracious. And so that means that we start to share things with people that they don't deserve. We give to others, even though they don't deserve it. We listen, even though people don't deserve our time. We we bless others, maybe financially, they they don't deserve that, right? But we, we start to give. We forgive others, even when they've done us wrong right? These are really hard things, but we start to grow in these graces and grace in order to share it with other people. This is what he's talking about. We need to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. So as we start going deeper in our relationship with God and we start to experience more and understand more of what he's done for us, hopefully that leads us to share with other people, right? And so this is part of our mission to share the grace of God with other people, right? Say, man, look what God's done for me. He can do the same for you. Hey, look, God's given me this. I can give it to others. One of the things that Jesus says, he says that as God has forgiven us, we would forgive others. So as he shares that with us, we share it with others in forgiveness. We forgive others, right? When we get comforted in difficult situations, the Bible tells us that we receive comfort or that we would comfort others. We're we're sharing the grace, spreading the grace to other people. So very important. We start off, we have to know Jesus. And then secondly, we have to grow in him, in his grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. Okay? Okay. Third, very simple. Okay? We want to know him. We want to grow in him. We want to serve him. Okay? You guys are like, okay, this is so obvious. But how do we do that? Okay? Well, get this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So 
This is when Jesus was being tempted back in the wilderness, and the devil came to him and wanted him to worship him. He said, said to Jesus, worship me. And Jesus said, no, 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 you get out of, you get out of here. Um, and he says, you worship the Lord God, and you serve him only. All sorts of passages all throughout the Old Testament and the New, but especially in the Old Testament, that talk about this, that we are meant to serve God, right? I think we all know that. Um, one obvious one, it says, uh, Deuteronomy 6.13, I didn't even put it in here, but it says, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and take oaths in his name. Fear the Lord and serve him, right? So we have to serve the Lord. How do we do that? We are followers of Jesus. We're called to serve him. So what does that look like? For us as individuals, how does each one of us, so like in theory, we throw these things out there. Oh, the, sir, the church needs to serve. You guys need to serve. We go, okay, yeah, it needs to serve. Okay, how do we do that specifically? I want to get real detailed on this, okay? So we start off a couple different things. Here's one, Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Titus chapter 3, verse 14, it says this, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful, okay? So it says here that we are meant to do good works, okay? And what specifically does he say? Meet urgent needs, okay? Meet needs. So what do you do? When you're looking to serve the Lord, you're looking to be on mission, you're looking for people with need, okay? What is the need here? Oh, these people, they need help here. Oh, these people, they're moving. Maybe we can help them move, okay? Oh, this person, they had surgery. They can't cook. Maybe we can make food for them, right? This person, they had an accident. They need money to pay for this. Maybe we can help them out financially, right? These are urgent needs that you can meet, so we, we go around, we look for needs. There are needs in the church. There are needs in your spheres of influence. What are your neighbors going through? Do you ever talk to them? We got to talk to our neighbors, right? And we got to find out what's going on. If you hear that they're in need, that there's something going on, maybe you could be the one to help them, right? James, it says that it's no good if you see a brother who's cold and destitute and you say, go, be warm, be filled, God bless you. You, you can't do that. He said, you've got to actually meet that need. And so this is the same thing that Paul's telling Titus. You've got to go and you've got to meet needs. So this is really, really practical. When you find someone that's in your sphere of influence that has a need, see if there's a way that you can help them. Sometimes there's no way that you can help them. Sometimes. But most of the time, you can jump in and you can help. You can help in some way, right? And, and maybe you could just be there for them to talk to them. Maybe they're going through a hard time. You just, they just need someone to talk to. That's the majority of problems, right? They need someone to talk to. Now, there are things that need, hey, well, I, I need someone to talk to, but I also need someone to carry these boxes to the moving van, okay? That, that, that could also be. But you got to think about these urgent needs. This is very, very important. Now, Paul states something that's very similar in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 13, it says this, that we are to be distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. So this also talks a little bit about the needs. We're going to distribute the needs of the saints. So this is talking about within the church, when there's needs, hey, I've got, you know, an extra broom. You, you're, you don't have a broom. Your broom broke. Here, take my broom, right? That's the most ridiculous example, but uh, it is, it's something that you can do. Like here's meeting a need, right? So it says that we need to make sure we are meeting those needs and that we are given to hospitality, right? Given to hospitality. So that means that we might have to open up our house for different things in order to welcome people in, in order to maybe make them a meal, give them a hot drink on a cold day. I don't know, whatever it is. But we have to be open to these things because this is what we're called to as Christians. So the first step, if we're going to be on mission, it's going to be very practical. We're looking to meet urgent needs, looking to meet needs, right? Number two, um, under the serving, uh, you want to use your gifts. Use your gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, uh, you guys have maybe read about this. It says this, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Okay? What's he saying here? He's saying the Holy Spirit has been given to all the believers in the church, and the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. 
He gives us gifts. And so he says, take the gifts that God has given you and use them because these are for, are given for the benefit of all, right? For everyone. Your gifts are not for you. They're for everybody. So if you got a gift, you got to use it in the body of Christ. So what, what abilities, what skills, what giftings do you have as a person? Everybody has something. Everybody. You probably have several. We got people that are super gifted in here. Great. How can you use your gifts to bless others? That's the point. It's not for you. It's always for others. Okay? So when we want to go on out, we want to make disciples, and we want to be living on mission, what do we do? Well, the main thing is you use your gift, and that's going to dictate the things that you do in terms of serving others, right? So I know in the body of Christ, I'm called to be a teacher, and so I've got to be finding different ways to teach. Even if I'm not up front, I'm going to find other ways to teach, whether it be a little Bible study or being doing discipleship, I'm going to always find a way to teach. What about you guys? What are the gifts that he's given to you? Okay. Now we can also talk about not even spiritual gifts, but it could be also just practical gifts, right? What can you do? Oh, well, I can fix things. Great. There's all sorts of people that need help fixing stuff, right? I bet your neighbors need help fixing stuff and you can go over there and bless them by fixing stuff for them. And what a great way to minister to somebody is when their sink is leaking, you know how to get in there and fix the thing. And then you get to build your relationship with them and you get to share a little bit of Jesus' love with them. That's awesome, right? So we're always looking to use our gifts, our skills, our abilities to reach other people for Jesus and bless them. So I want you guys to think about this. When we're going through and we're talking about mission living, it just means using the skills, the abilities, the giftings that God has given you. And he has given you something, and it's very good, and he's probably given you several things that are very good, and you can use all of them, right? So I want you guys to think, okay, if I'm going to live in on God's mission, how am I going to use my giftings? And you guys can find ways to do that. Okay, third way, follow your calling, okay? Check out Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, verse 9. Here's what it says. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Okay? What's going on here? Paul had gone down with Barnabas to meet the head of the church, the heads, right? Peter, James, and John. These are the big dogs, right? And so he goes down to Jerusalem, and he meets these guys, and what do they perceive? They said, man, this guy Paul, he's got a very specific calling in his life. And he said that it was a calling to reach the Gentiles, okay? Now, there's only two types of people in the world when you look at it like this. They're either you're Jewish or you're not Jewish, right? And if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. That's what it says. So he had a calling, Paul had a calling to go reach the Gentiles, okay? Peter did not. Peter had a, had a calling to go reach the Jews, okay? Now, it didn't mean that they, don't, they never talk, that Paul never talks to Jews and Peter never talks to Gentiles. That's not what it means. But their general calling is towards this group of people, right? And so with that general focus, he went following his calling to preach the message of Jesus to the Gentiles. That was his calling, okay? Now, his giftings were different. He was a teacher, he was an apostle, he was a preacher of God's word, like he had other giftings, but part of his calling was to go specifically to the Gentiles, okay? So each of us has a calling in our life that we are to do something. What is it that we're called to do? Where is it that we're called to go? For some of us, we're like, okay, I'm going to go reach these specific people. I was called for many years to go down to Brazil. I was called to reach Brazilians. Maybe you guys weren't, probably not. But I was called to go down there. And so I had a very specific calling to go down as a missionary to Brazil, right? So now I'm here. That's not going on, okay? I don't meet very many Brazilians, okay? So who am I going to reach, okay? Well, I feel like I got a calling towards that university. And I'm praying for that university. I'm going over that university, right? USAO, I want to reach that place for Jesus, okay? So I'm going to keep going over there because that's where I feel called to go, Okay? Now, what about you guys? Where is your calling? Each one of us has a calling, okay? Maybe it's not super specific. Maybe it's a little more general. I don't know. 
But God's got something for you, just like he has for Paul, just like he has for me. God's got a calling for each one of us because he wants you to be part of his mission. He's including you as a part of his plan. So we've got to realize, okay, what is my calling? What am I, who am I supposed to focus in on? Okay? When you have certain people, you can see very clearly they are called to reach the kids, right? And they go and they do children's ministry. And they're, they're loving. They love being around kids. They love serving. Man, I, I can't do that. I can't do the kids, right? They drive me up the wall. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, I, I love babies. But man, when they get around two years old, three years old, I'm like, keep your toddlers away from me. But other people, that's what they love. They love those little kids. And they just want to play with them. They want to teach them about Jesus. It's like, man, that's a calling, right? Joseph has a calling to reach the youth, right? And so he's always working with the kids, working with the youth. He wants to reach them for Jesus. So what about you guys? You guys all have a calling too, okay? So I'm just trying to throw out some examples here to make sure that you guys have it clear in your minds. Each one of us has, given, has been given a calling from God. God loves you so much. He wants you to be part of his plan, and he's given you a very specific calling. Some have a calling for women. Some have a calling to reach the men. Some have a calling for kids. Some have a calling for adults. It's, there's all sorts of callings that we can have, right? We've got to start working towards that. Number four, he says, for the rest of this, we need to seek God, okay? The rest of things that we're not sure about, we seek God. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 Verse 23, it says this, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Very interesting. We don't understand everything that we're supposed to be doing. He says here, men cannot understand and direct their own lives. Okay, now I'm sure there's certain things that you know how to do, right? But for we're talking about the purposes of God, we don't know how to walk in the ways of God. And so what are we supposed to do? If we don't know how to do the rest, okay, we're trying to follow after meeting urgent needs. We're trying to figure out our giftings. We're trying to follow our calling. Okay, we got all these things. Great. But then what about the rest? What if we can't figure it out? What do we do? We seek God. Okay? We seek God. Okay? So... God has a very specific plan for your life. I want you guys to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Well, I'll just look at verse 2. It says this. Do not be conformed to, the, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? What are we seeing here? God has a plan. It's the will of God. This is his plan. And God has a plan for each one of our lives. And that plan, he says, is good, is acceptable, is perfect. Okay? The word perfect is kind of confusing, but it, it talks about being complete. Okay? Finished. Okay? He's got a complete, perfect plan for your life. It, it encompasses all areas of your life, including the ministries that you're called to do. So you say, well, what am I supposed to do, Lord? I don't know. He says, He's got a plan. So our job is to seek that plan. And it's funny because Jesus tells us all the time to seek him, right? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So you want to know God's will? Seek, knock, ask, right? That's what he says. We've got we've to go to the Lord. We've got to seek the Lord for everything that he has. And if we keep seeking the Lord in all that he has, he will begin to reveal his plan for our lives more and more. And so when we're kind of confused, there's kind of some areas like, what am I supposed to do next, Lord? He has the answers, not us, right? Hebrews chapter 11 has another verse I think is fantastic. It says this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God wants to reward those who diligently seek him. 
And when we come to God and we ask, we're seeking, we're knocking, Lord, I don't know what to do. Help me to find the way. Help me to find your path. God is longing to reveal his will to us. And so what do we do? We got to seek. Okay? Now, this means that we have a little bit of work to do. Right? A little bit of work. Okay? Up until this point, it's been mostly all about God. Okay? We get to know him. We experience his grace. We, we, got, we start to feel his love in our lives. We, we, we use the gifts that he gave us. It's like, it's all about what God's done. Now he says, okay, your job in all of this is to pray and to seek him and to start seeing what he has for your life. And so this means that you come into God and you say, okay, God, what do you want from me? Okay, now this could be a terrifying thing. Because he might call you to do something that you don't really want to do, okay? Now, I don't think he will, but he, he could. He could, right? Some people are like, no, God, this is my plan. I'm going with my plan, and it's going to be amazing. Come and bless my plan. And God's saying, no, 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 not your plan, my plan, right? Remember when Jesus was praying? He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in agony, and he's saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. This should be the attitude of all Christians. If we're a follower of Jesus, we should have the same mindset. Not my will, but your will. And so what that means is we as Christians, we're, we're doing, we're surrendering our plans to God. We bring them up to the altar of God and say, okay, God, here, take my plans, do whatever you want. What do you want me to do? Okay. I told the people on Wednesday night uh, when I was in college, I went off to college and I, I wasn't sure what I was going to study. And at my college, it's a little bit different because you had to apply under the major that you wanted to study, which is really complex because when you're 17 years old and you're applying for colleges, you don't know what you want to do the rest of your life, right? And so I'm like, I don't know what I want to do. And my mom said to me, she said, well, you're pretty good at writing. Do you want to do journalism? And I started thinking about it and I was like, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Let's do journalism. And so then I started dreaming about it, right? I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with journalism? And so then I came up with this plan, right? But we saw in Jeremiah that we can't understand our own ways, right? Okay, so I come up with this plan, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I got this great plan. I'm going to study journalism. I'm going to graduate with a degree in journalism. I'm going to get a job after I graduate working at Surfer Magazine. Then I'm going to travel the world watching surfing and writing about surfing and surfing. And then they're going to pay me to do that. And I thought, man, this is genius. This is it, right? They're going to pay me to go surf the world? How awesome is this? And God said, no, that's not what I have for you. I want you to be a missionary. And I was like, but Lord, surfing. And he's like, missionary, right? Sometimes God calls us to do something that we're like, we're not planning, right? We got to surrender our will. Now, I came to the Lord later on. I said, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do in my life, you do it. And then that's when I went off to be a missionary, right? Um, but it, it does call for us to surrender our lives to him, that we would come in and say, okay, God, what do you want? And in order to do that, we've got to seek the Lord and try to find him, right? And try to find his will, okay? I want to leave you with two more verses. Lamentations. Chapter 3, verse 25. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 25. It says this. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Okay? He's telling us right here. God wants to do good in your life, but he wants you to wait for him. Don't jump out and just start doing things. Don't just make your own plan and start running after it. He wants you to wait, and he wants you to seek him. Seek him. God, come and meet me. What do you want me to do? Okay? And then something very similar in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55. Whoops. Sorry, I skipped past it. I'll just read it up there. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Well, God is near. God is near to all of us through Jesus Christ, and you have the opportunity to seek the Lord and to call upon him, and this is so important for us to understand. God wants to know you. He wants to know you intimately. He wants you to know him, and in knowing him, 
you have the opportunity to know his will, his plan for your life. So if we're going to be a mission church, a mission living church, well, that means we're on God's mission, not ours. And that means we have to do God's will and not our own. And that means we have to seek him in order to know what he wants us to do as a church and as individuals. And I'll tell you what, God has something awesome for each one of you. He really does. He has an amazing plan. It is good. It is acceptable. It is perfect. It's complete in every area of your life. So what do you got to do? Well, let's seek that will, right? If we told you that you had a treasure, there was a treasure somewhere around your property. It was somewhere around there, and you just got to find it. What would you do? Well, you'd start looking, get a metal detector, right? Start looking for clues, start digging things up, right? Because you want to find that treasure. Well, God has a treasure for you. He's got a perfect plan. And he says, I want to bless your life beyond anything that you can imagine, beyond the things that you can plan on your own. But you got to seek me in order to find that. So you would start seeking that treasure. You can do the same in Jesus, right? So let's seek the Lord together. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you this morning for everyone who's here. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us open hearts and humility to be able to seek you and surrender our plans for our lives. Our lives are yours. And we ask, Lord, that you would come and that you would reveal yourself to us, help us to know you more, and help us to know your plan for us. And I pray that each one of us would begin to, to find our purpose in life, to follow, find our calling in order to serve you better and to live on your mission and to see more people come to know Jesus. So please guide us in this process. Bless this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.